Back in the early 2000s, I started working for a compact dealer. I retired my Toshiba Portage 300 CT and got one of these. Today we are going to restore these two vintage compacts from the early 2000s. These machines were sold as the EVO N160 to the left here and the Presario 1700. They may have been sold with other model names too. If you know, please share because that might help us to find working restore CDs much easier. The EVO was shipped with Windows 2000 and the Presario to the right here was shipped with Windows XP. However, early machines came with ME pre-installed. I got my first 1700 when it was brand new, very early in 2001, if I remember correctly. So my first machine had Windows ME and a Pentium 3 700 MHz. Both of these machines have a Pentium 3 1 GHz now. I don't remember if they came like this or if I have upgraded from something slower. Unfortunately, these machines have a nasty issue. They were painted in a rubberized paint that gets very sticky and nasty. My first machine got sticky when it was still in use back in the day, so they didn't last very long. The paint doesn't just get sticky, but it also comes off and makes a bloody mess of whatever it lands on. Aside from this, both displays have gone flimsy. One of the mouse buttons has stopped working and the Presario is too noisy to use. Let's start with a 1700 and see if we can fix it. I actually featured this Presario in one of my videos a few years ago. And in that video we played some Black Mirror. So I guess it's about bloody time I finished the game. Now that the compact is on the bench again. Okay, so if you have seen one of these before, you may have noticed that it looks a bit odd. And that is because I started to make a video about this machine several years ago. So originally it looked like this. I ended up never finishing that video, but I did remove the paint from the lid. So at least the lid isn't sticky anymore. I guess you could mask this area off and respray this part in a similar blue color, but I think I'm gonna keep it like this. I think it looks rather nice without the blue paints. Okay, so I have repaired tons of these machines, but that was 20 years ago. So let's see how much I remember. Uh, I think we should start with the bezel above the keyboard with these two screws. And my old sticker here says, well, if I can read my own writing, XP Home, Service Pack 3, Annoying Fan, Bad Right Click, and Volume 9. I have no idea what that means. And we've got Black Mirror installed. And I guess we'll find out what volume 9 means. So let's get inside here. So the first thing we need to do is to remove this bezel here. At least if I remember correctly. And it's held in place with a bunch of plastic tabs. And this is not uncommon for a compact to be the first part to come off. And being an early 2000 machine it has an internet zone with a couple of buttons here to start the email, uh, presumably the web browser. I don't really remember. And if I remember correctly, I upgraded my machine back in the day from a 700 to an 800 megahertz Pentium 3. Okay, so this is the bezel and all the tabs look fine. So that's a good start. The plastics in this machine Seems to have aged well. Uh, next up we need to remove this shield here. Like so. And uh, now we can remove the keyboard. Like this. So a lot of these old laptops are a lot more modular than modern machines. So you could replace the CPU and change it to something faster. A 1 GHz Pentium 3, 512K cache. And the heat paste has not dried up. Because this machine is using one of these heat pads instead. So I wonder if the noise is coming from this fan. Well, it looks normal and it's actually very clean. So this machine seems to have a low mileage. 
Okay, and I think the next step might be these plastic hinge covers. Let's find out. I don't remember if the lid needs to be open or not. Yes, it should. At least slightly opened. And man, that sticky paint is so nasty. Someone must have messed up the recipe. And now I think we can remove the entire display assembly. Because now we can reach the connector. Presumably for the backlights. And the main graphics connector on this side here. And I'm doing this very slowly. So I won't break anything. And that should free up the display assembly. And I wonder why that display is so flimsy. Oh, that was an easy fix. So these two screws needed to be tightened. That was the entire problem. And these two screws were not identical. So if you're playing along, keep track of the screws. So next up, I think this machine has a couple of screws at the back here. And it does. Two on each hinge. So now we should be able to just lift the entire display off. Like this. And aside from the sticky paint, this machine seems to be in really good condition. And the display has aged really well. Unlike some of my vintage laptops, this display still looks pretty damn good. And since the lid has already been cleaned off, I'm just gonna put this aside. Okay, let's turn the machine around. And remove the drive. Unfortunately, I only have the DVD drive for this machine. Back in the day, I also used to have the diskette drive. But I lost that drive long time ago. And uh, next up we have the battery. That probably needs replacement. And underneath this cover here, we have the RAM. Can't remember if I have upgraded RAM in this machine. Probably not. Because there's only one RAM stick inside here. And it has compact numbers on it. And it's a 256 meg 133 stick. I'll see if I can find some more. And then we have the hard drive. With this annoying screw here that needs to come out completely, I think. And now the hard drive should come out. And it's a Toshiba drive with compact numbers. And the label doesn't say what size it is. So now we can continue and remove the remaining screws underneath the machine. And if we turn the machine around, we've got a couple of screws from this side too. Ah uh, yeah, I forgot this one here. What a rookie I am. So there is one screw hidden inside here. So there's this rubber cover here. And behind it we have a printer port, VGA connector and S-Video. And inside here is a hidden screw. Sneaky compact. And then I think we need to remove this cover here. And then we have one more screw here. Okay, I think it was the last screw. Yes, I think it was. So let's remove the connector for the mouse pad. I think it needs some persuasion to come off. And here it is. Okay, and I just remembered... I have actually removed the paint from this side too. So you can see slight difference between this area here and this area here. So we don't really need to disassemble this machine more than this. But since one of the buttons is broken, we're gonna have to remove the main PCB anyways. And which one was it? Bad right click. And it's this push button here. And I don't have a spare. I guess we could snatch one of these. Because I'm obviously not going to start Outlook Express from 2001 anytime soon. Especially not with this button here. Yeah, I think that's the best approach. We'll snatch this button here. Okay, I guess we'll start with the speakers. And they are pretty decent. I mean, at least for a laptop. The machine has a label down here that says JBL Pro. Don't know if that's just a marketing thing. But they are okay. And I just realized my mistake here. I wasn't using my compact screwdriver. 
This is the screwdriver I was using back in the day when I repaired these machines. So I obviously have to use it for this project. Okay, let's continue with a hard drive cage. So I guess this is going to be a complete disassembly, at least of one of the machines. Okay, let's continue with these reinforcing parts for the hinges. Uh, there are about five types of screws so far. So I'm going to have to keep track of which screw goes where. And hopefully the remaining screws are identical. And I think there might be a hidden screw underneath the modem. So let's pull it out. And there wasn't. So which screw did I forget? No, I think I got all the screws out. So now it's just jammed. I think it feels like it's stuck in something sticky and it is. Ah, now it came free, finally. So it got stuck in this thing here, underneath this piece of shield here. Well, okay, now it's free at least. Okay, so since this board is from the early 2000s, I decided to check the caps, but there's actually just one electrolytic cap and I can't see any signs of leakage. So I'm going to leave it in, but we do have a problem because the button here that we need to replace is very, very close to this amp connector here. So we can't use a rework station because that would melt the housing of this connector here right away. And the same thing up here. There is no way we can shield this connector here off. So this could be a bit of a tricky repair. But let's just try and see how it goes. Well, I think it might be difficult to even reach this damn button here. Even with the smallest tip with my soldering iron. Worst case, we'll have to remove that amp connector. Okay, let's try with some low melting point solder first. Yeah, I can barely get inside here. Uh, now I'm getting some solder on top of the switch. Okay, let's remove that amp connector, but first some fresh solder on the pads and the desoldering gun at a relatively low temperature. And unfortunately it didn't clear out the through holes. So let's add some fresh solder and try again. And apparently this one is hooked up to the ground plane because it takes forever to melt. So let's crank up the heat on the desoldering gun and try again. Yeah, this is definitely working. I thought this would be an easy fix. But I was wrong. And one of the pads still has some old solder left. So let's reflow it and try again. Let's try to push on the pins. Yeah, they are moving freely, so let's try to push that connector out. Oh, I hope it's not glued in place. Let's have a look at the other side. Well, I can't see anything weird on this side. So let's try to pry it off. There we go. Okay, so now we have way better access to these solder pads here. Okay, so the damn camera decided to turn itself off. But what I did here was to apply some low melting point solder. Heated both sides. And that button came right off. And the important thing about this stuff here is to remove it completely from the board. Because we don't want to mix this stuff with the proper solder. And I'm very happy to see a regular coin cell on this board because it's flat and I have a replacement and I'm also pretty fed up with the error I get every time I boot this machine and somehow I managed to get some solder inside these through holes here that's better okay let's see if we can do the same trick on this button here so there are some components very very close to this button here so there's about one millimeter of clearance here. So I'm going to have to be very, very careful here. And I hope this button can take the abuse. 
And the trickiest thing here is to get this on camera actually. And it worked. Excellent. So let's clean up this mess. Without melting the pads of the tiny tiny resistors all over this board. Yeah, I think we're okay. Okay, so I cleaned up the switch. That was a bit tricky. So let's solder it down here instead. And hopefully it survived all that heat. Feels kind of mushy. So I think it's filled with flux. That could be a problem. Well, the only thing we can do is to test it. And I guess I could flush it with IPA. Apparently this is the ground. Because it's just sucking up all the heat. Okay, all the pads are soldered. So I guess I'll try to flush that flux out. And I'm gonna use a spray can. Because it has some pressure and hopefully it will push that flux out. And I'm gonna have to do this off camera. Because I'm gonna get IPA all over the place. Oh, now the switch actually feels normal again. So maybe it's not needed, but I'm gonna clean it anyway. Why not? Okay, so I sprayed it with tons of IPA. And then I used some compressed air. And blew all that gunk out. And it feels kind of normal. I think it's okay. I guess we better try it before we continue. Okay, as few parts as possible hooked up. Let's see if it works. Oh, now I see what's making all that racket. That hard drive is very noisy. So we're gonna go ahead and replace it. And it doesn't post, so something is wrong. Okay, let's try with an external display. Uh, no, we're getting nothing. Okay, I did a whole bunch of tests off camera. And this machine is behaving really weirdly. But after cleaning the RAM stick, I now have a splash screen. How weird is this? But it doesn't continue to post. So something still isn't quite right with this machine. Oh, you're not gonna believe this. So I cleaned out the socket for the RAM stick, but it still wouldn't post. So I moved the stick to the other socket. And now the damn thing posts and boots. And apparently this board doesn't post without a RAM stick. Let's see if it will work with a USB keyboard. I think it does. But the display settings are way off. That is pretty weird behavior for a laptop. Well, I guess at least now we can test our mouse button. Well, this is definitely not 1024. Well, I guess this resolution problem here is because we don't have the display hooked up to the board. So maybe it gets a bit confused here. Okay, so let's try the left mouse button. It doesn't work when I just push on it with my finger. And uh, no, it's not happy. So I'm trying the mouse button now that we didn't replace. And it doesn't work. Let's try with the trackpad connected. Okay, trackpad hooked up. Let's try again. Okay, left click works now. Now the trackpad is just resting on the motherboard. But right click works now. Awesome. We fixed it. Awesome. So the mouse button now works on this machine. But I'll do some more tests off camera with the RAM stick and pinpoint the issue. Okay, so I just moved the RAM stick to the first slot again. And uh, now the damn thing works. So perhaps the Oxit did its magic and just needed a few minutes. So I'm gonna leave it for now and I'll keep an eye on that socket. Okay, let's get that nasty rubberized paint off because if I put my palms on this stuff here, I get stuck to it. And unfortunately that also means I have to remove these stickers because we're gonna clean this stuff off with IPA. So these stickers here are going to start to peel off anyways. So let's heat them up. And peel them off right away. I guess I could try to find replacements on eBay. And this sticker was actually made out of aluminium. So perhaps it could be reused. I don't remember if these machines were offered with Celeron. Yeah, check out that paint. It just comes right off. 
Okay, so this is gonna get messy, really messy. So I have some protection on my workbench. So what I'm gonna do now is to just spray the paints with isopropanol alcohol. And eventually this will dissolve the paint. And while we continue to work on the project, I'm going to reapply this stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna let the IPA do its magic while we continue with the project. Okay, let's solder back that amp connector for the battery. And I keep reapplying the IPA on the case because it dries up very quickly. And that was the last pin. Okay, let's give this a try. And why is from my own mistakes? I'm gonna wear gloves this time. So I'm just gonna keep applying more IPA. And then I'm gonna start scrubbing this stuff off. And this is not a quick and easy project. But as you can see, the damp paint comes off. Yeah, I can see the gray color it's coming through the paint here now. I guess there might be some chemicals that are more efficient. But this stuff is really kind on the plastics. So this is a safe method. Safe but very very slow. And if you're playing along, get a large bottle of IPA. Because you're gonna need it. Okay, so I'm obviously going to skip ahead here. But in real life here, this is what I'm going to do, probably for a half an hour. And unfortunately, this was a fail, so I'm not quite finished here, but the rubberized paint is coming off. However, there is some imperfections in the plastic underneath that paint. So, unfortunately, this piece here doesn't look quite as good as the lid and the bottom half of the machine. So I'm gonna have to decide if I'm going to leave it like this or respray it in a different color because matching this color here, that's mission impossible. Okay, so I ended up respraying that piece and while the paint is drying, let's have a look at the Evo. So as you can see, the lid is completely different. It doesn't have that weird blue part on top of it and it doesn't have the large compact logo. And unfortunately, this lid is all blotchy. Not sure how well the camera picks this up. But there are some dark spots all over this lid. So why not start by trying to clean that off? So let's try with some isopropanol. Well, this spot came right off. Well, it does get better. But there's quite a lot left, so I'll try some more. I don't want to respray more than necessary. It does get much better. Let's see how good we can make it. Yeah, check out this. So, I guess that's just dirt. And underneath this machine there was a sticker with a company name. And from what I could tell, that company was working with air conditioning. So I guess perhaps this machine was also on the field installing air conditioners. Yeah, check this grime out. Okay, so I probably skipped ahead here. But I have spent about half a minute cleaning the lid with isopropanol. And it's not perfect, but it's definitely good enough to keep like this. Okay, let's start taking it apart. And apparently the latch for the battery is broken because this battery came flying as soon as I flipped the machine. Uh, we've got some residue from that sticker I mentioned a second ago. So stuff like this is actually easier to clean off before disassembling the machine. And apparently this machine is okay. So the good thing about these Evos is that this machine came with Windows 2000. And I don't know about you, but I think that operating system is awesome. So hopefully... The only thing this machine needs is some cleaning. And same thing here. Only one RAM stick. So I'm gonna have to go through my stash. And see if I can find some more. Uh, this is even worse. This is a 128 meg. And this hard drive was in a better condition. So it probably gets to stay. Um, by the looks of it, it's the original drive. Uh, this machine is slightly different. 
So this part here is painted in that sticky nasty paint too. Whereas it was silver on the compact, like this bezel here. And by the way, the paint on the display here is not the sticky type. This is a different solid paint, so it doesn't need to be removed. And the keyboard looks really nice on this machine. So I don't think this machine has seen much use. Yeah, this keyboard looks minty. That's nice. Now let's see if I remember correctly. Yes, I did. That's a 1 GHz Pentium 3 as well. Yeah, look at that sticky paint. When I opened the lid, it came off this part here. So everything this case touches gets some of that sticky paint on it. Uh, I guess I may skip ahead here a bit. These machines are almost identical. Okay, let's compare the motherboards. Well, they look pretty identical to me. I can't see any difference whatsoever. Uh, let's compare the part numbers. 2513-81-001. Yeah, they are the same part. So, no difference between these machines, really. Aside from some blue paint on one of the bezels and a choice of operating system. Yeah, those marketing guys. Okay, so let's see what's wrong with that battery latch. Well, I think it's missing a spring. It should probably be spring-loaded. Let me check the other case. Yes, that is correct. So there is a small spring inside here. So if I push on this piece of plastic here, it moves back out and locks the battery in place. But not in this chassis. So I guess I'll have a look through my stash and see if I can find a tiny spring. And I did, but it's way too long. But I guess we could cut it to size. So I guess I'll just wing it. Uh, let's try this size. I uh, know the difficult part is to get it inside here. Oh, almost. Let's try again. Well, that was easier said than done. Okay, I had a look with some magnification here. Uh, it is partially broken. It's supposed to have two tabs. And one of the tabs is missing. So either someone dropped this machine or maybe try to force the battery in the wrong way around. Let's see if we can remove this piece. No, not very likely. And we'll probably just break it. So let's just keep trying. It should be possible, but I'm going to use some magnification and do this off camera. And it worked. So that was actually quite easy with some magnification. So when I push on this tab now, it pops right out. I see. This isn't going to hold up. Unfortunately, that was not enough to just replace that spring. Because uh, this locking piece is coming right off. Because one of the tabs is missing here. So there's one tab on this side. And there should be one on this side too. And it's missing. Crap. Well, it does work, so... I guess I'll just put a sticker over the switch here. And obviously a piece like that is impossible to find. Unless I can find a spare case. Well, in that case, no pun intended, you only need to replace that CMOS battery. And there isn't really any cleaning needed inside here. This machine is already very clean. How about that fan? Yeah, even the fan is clean. So this machine hasn't seen much use. Okay, so then we need to remove everything from the top cover before I start cleaning it. And I did this off camera with the Presario. So I guess I'll show you on this machine instead. So there's one plastic piece here. And then we have the two mouse buttons down here. Held in place with two screws. And next we need to remove the shield. And it's held in place with five tiny screws. 
yeah, this is obviously very nostalgic to me. I'm really going to enjoy to play some DOS games on this machine later. And correction, there are six screws to remove this shield. And the trackpad is held with copper tape. And then we have the tricky bit. So this multifunction button here, and I'm just going to try to push it out. And it worked. And inside here is a square piece of foam that has gone completely stale. And the last part to remove is this plastic piece here for the battery and power LED. Okay, so I guess I'll start cleaning this off camera the same way I cleaned the Presario. And before I start cleaning, I thought I'd just show you. So this is how easy this paint comes off. And this is just some sticky, nasty rubber. Disgusting. Damn you, Compaq, for using this stuff. Well, I got the same problem with the second case. The area that was visibly silver on the Presario looks pretty good. But the rest of the cover has some really bad imperfections. And towards the edges, it has a very thin coat of paint. So I ended up respraying this cover too. And while we wait, let's try out a new hard drive for the Presario. Because it's too bloody noisy. So for comparison, this is the Evo drive. Not sure if the microphone picks this up, but it's pretty nice and quiet. So another sign of this machine not being used that much. Now let's compare it to the drive from the Presario. Yeah, that drive is a lot noisier. I'm moving closer. That is too noisy for my taste. So let's replace it. Let's try this 40 gig Seagate. And the original drive was a 20 gig Toshiba. Well, that is a very quiet drive. I wonder if it's working. That is suspiciously quiet. Okay, I tested the drive in another machine. And it works. So apparently it's just very quiet and awesome. Now let's go old school. I did some searching online and I found the restore CDs for this machine. And this is a set of discs for the early machines. And that means Windows Millennium. And that's actually what I want for nostalgia reasons. Because that's what I had on my first machine. So I pulled out another vintage compact. Slightly newer than the 1700. And burning the discs with power ISO. And that was the sound of a freshly burned restore CD. So let's install a drive. So this is actually the Evo. But since they are identical, it doesn't really matter. We can restore that hard drive and then move it to the Presario. And by the way, these machines can't boot from the USB. And it seems to work. Awesome. And I found these discs on the Internet Archive. The software that was previously installed on your compact personal computer will now be restored on your hard disk. Sounds good to me. And apparently it's made with PowerQuest, Partition Magic. I haven't used that software in decades. And now it's installing some drivers. And it's all done for me. Very nice. What a time saver. Back in the day I used Ghost for this. So I just made an image of whatever machine I was working on. And then put the image back on a new drive. And I kept one image from a freshly installed machine at hand. And those images are gone since long, of course. I actually upgraded my machine to Windows 2000 back in the day. But since I'm going to run Windows 2000 on the Evo, I might as well go with ME on this machine. Just purely for nostalgia. ME is a bit buggy. But it's not as bad as most people claim online. I haven't actually had much trouble with this version of Windows. But maybe other people did. Okay, I skipped ahead here, but it was complaining about missing a couple of drivers. And it wasn't quite finished yet, so now it does some installation inside of Windows. And the graphics are all messed up. Welcome to Microsoft Windows. I haven't seen this splash screen in a very long time. And I spoke too soon about Windows Millennium. 
I got an error right away. <laughs> okay, so I took a trip back to 2001 with a Wayback Machine. And apparently these boards can take up to 1 gig of RAM. PC133. So I went ahead and ordered 4 sticks on eBay. But they are coming in from China, so that's going to take a while. And meanwhile, the best I can do is one 256 stick and one 128 stick. That should be sufficient for now. So let's put this thing back together. And hopefully I still remember in what order I removed all the parts a couple of days ago. I think I'm going to skip ahead here a bit. Because this is basically the disassembly in the reverse order. And we need to transfer our quiet Seagate drive to the cradle for the Presario. It's a bit slow, so I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it in this machine. But we'll definitely use it for now. I'm not sure what the best solution is for portables of this vintage. I know there were SSD drives with ID connectors on the market for a while. But I'm not so sure if that's still the best solution. Uh, noisy drive be gone. And this is the result from the resprayed cover. And I think I was lucky because this looks pretty damn good. So I just went to the local store that sells car parts. And they have this huge rack of spray paints. And I just grabbed one that looks similar to the original color. And this is quite close to the original paint. So I'm not sure what the camera will make of this. It probably just looks plain silver, but it's not. It has a blue tint to it. You can kind of see the match already, because this part here was covered with sticky tape. So this is the old paint, and this is the new paint. That is a pretty close match. I think there is a tiny bit more blue in the original color. And obviously also this part here was in that rubberized blue paint. Let's reassemble it and see what the final result will look like. And that copper tape isn't doing its thing anymore. And I think it might be grounding the trackpad to the chassis. So I'm not going to replace it. I'm going to leave it in and add some more tape on top of it. Because I don't have copper tape that thick. And hopefully this will work anyways. And then we have the mouse buttons. And they still have some of that sticky, nasty, rubberized paint on them. So I better clean that off. And they have not been resprayed, so I guess we can have a look at the difference right away. Yeah, that is a pretty good match. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. There is a bit more blue in the original color. I'm not sure the camera will even pick this up. But in real life here, I can see the difference. And there was a square foam pad inside here that had completely dried up. So I'm going to replace it with a couple of thin strips like this. And hopefully it will work as intended. And now we can put this piece back in. So I hope the camera will make this justice, but I'd say that is more than good enough. What a great project. I have many fond memories from this era. I was basically just playing with computers all day long. I obviously didn't do any board level repairs back then, but still this is fun too. And uh, to keep track of all the different screws, I tend to take pictures when I repair laptops. And overall, I'd say these machines are pretty well built. They have not gone brittle. And they don't have any weird hard to reach plastic tabs. Like some of the early ThinkPads. So overall, pretty easy to service and repair. Okay, time to put our nice and shiny cover on. And man, that looks so good. I honestly didn't expect a result this nice. This is awesome. And I'll do my best to put the right screw back in the right place. And if you're playing along, don't over tighten these screws. As you can see on how I'm holding the screwdriver, 
I'm really not using much force at all. This chassis is well built. But if you use too much force, you will break it anyways. And now it's time for the display to come on. What a fun project. And I'm kind of tempted to respray the entire machine since I got such great results with the cover. But let's not take this too far. And instead get these hinge covers back on and finish this video on time. And we are actually almost done here. So let's install the keyboard and the last bezel to see the final results with our resprayed cover. But first this shield here. And damn that looks good. I know the camera doesn't do well with colors. Especially a color like this. But this looks factory original. If you don't know it has been resprayed, you probably wouldn't notice. Oh, and I got some sticky paint on the DVD ROM. So I better clean this off first. And that's much better. And that was the last of the sticky paint for this machine. And then we have this rubber cover here for this connector. And the last part to go in with a satisfying click is the battery. I ran into a minor problem with the Presario. Apparently these machines have a better chipset than the very early machines that came with Windows ME. So there are no drivers available for these machines that will work with this version of Windows. At least not that I could find. And I wasn't able to find Windows 2000 drivers or restore CDs online for this chipset either. But luckily the Evo still has a working Windows 2000 installation. And on the C drive there is a folder named Compaq. And it contains all the drivers for these machines. So I installed an OEM version of Windows 2000 on the Presario. And then transferred and installed the four missing drivers. If you know where they could be found online, please share. And if not, let me know where would be a good place for me to upload these drivers. And now is a good time to binge watch some of my previous videos. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. If you want to support me too, you will find the link in the description. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next week.